I'm very thankful that uh, this worked out to have four meetings. <laughs> I know that's a lot of sit time, and my apologies for that. But, you know, if, if I were an artist, I would not be a portraitist or a still life. I'm one of those guys that does big murals. <laughs> and um, because it's, it's the big picture that, that intrigues me. Because, as, as was said, I'm not interested in the story for the sake of the story, although I love stories. I'm interested in the, sake, I'm interested in the story for the sake of, of getting something done. We've been diddling around here for so long, it's, it's time to you know, figure out what we need to do, where our focus needs to be, do that, and get the job done. That's just, that's just kind of my attitude. Um, and so that's why you see the, uh, the title. Yes, you see, the, oh, that looks kind of special. <laughs> I'm not sure what's happening there, but that's okay. Um, the, um, we're, as I say, I'm, I'm dealing on a very large canvas. And so we're going back to the beginning of the problem. And um, that's all the way back to Lucifer's Rebellion. That's, that's where the problem began, right? Okay. Um, why do I do that? Because of statements like this, okay? God calls for far more tact, more wise generalship than has yet been given him by his human agents. There is need of keen, sharp, uh, excuse me, there is need of sharp, sanctified thinking and keen work to counteract the ingenious ideas, excuse me, ingenious plans. I'm having a hard time reading that. Ingenious plans of Satan. For better or for worse, we're involved in this war. <laughs> you know, and, and for too long, it seems to me, we've kind of approached the great controversy as a spectator sport. Um, it's sure fun to watch it rage. But God's asking us to play a part. And at some point, somebody has to get around to playing the part properly. <laughs> that's, that's just, you know, I don't know. <clears throat> the Lord will not write as wise those who cannot distinguish between a tree that bears thornberries and a tree that bears olives. I, I don't even know what kind of thornberries she was talking about there, to be honest. And, and, you know, I didn't grow up in California or anything, so I don't know a lot about olives either. But I'm going to take both of those as... Um, as simply illustrations, you know, and at the risk of dumbing things down a bit, if we can't tell the difference between apples and oranges, we got a problem. Okay, I, I, I can relate to apples and oranges better than thornberries and olives. In the Great Controversy, there are many issues which require a bit of discrimination. You have to be able to tell the difference between good and bad. If we're going to be good soldiers, we need to understand the the issues, and specifically the issues that confront us today. There's a, you know, an old saying, you, you know, historians talk about it, military types talk about it, maybe you've heard it. It says that the generals are always ready to fight the last war. Right? Oh, we're going to learn the lessons. Which is why at the beginning of World War II, they had the famous Maginot line, right? Which might have been really helpful in World War I, but it cost about an extra half hour for the Germans to write over it in World War II. It was, it was totally worthless because the generals were ready for the last war. And the last war didn't come around again. It was a new war. We are in the great controversy, and you know it's, it's a progressive thing. It changes over time. I want to know what we're supposed to be doing now. You know? I, I, yeah, sure, Martin Luther, great guy. I love Reformation history. You know, I'm, I'm a history buff, right? I, I like all that stuff. We're not there. We're here. It's a different, it's a different ballpark today. It's a different um, game, in a sense. Okay, let's go on. Start at the beginning. <clears throat> what we commonly think of as the beginning, if I just said... The beginning, from a biblical sense, which, which verse would you think of? 
Genesis 1-1. You know, that's actually the last of the three available beginnings. <laughs> Can you think of another beginning? In the beginning... Mm, well, you're actually not too far off, but, but it doesn't use that term there. John 1-1. One, one. In the beginning was the Word. And that's the first beginning. And we're not really interested in that one either. We're looking for that one in between. Okay. <laughs> So what's the one in between? And now it's not, it doesn't say in the beginning, but from the beginning. What's the Bible verse? From the beginning. It's not as common. You are of your father the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning. And does not stand in the truth, for he is a liar and the father of it. Okay. So that's the beginning we're talking about. That's not the beginning of time immemorial with, you know, the, in the beginning was the word. That's not the beginning of the creation of earth. It was before the creation of earth. It's not even the beginning of Lucifer's existence. It's just the beginning of sin. That's the problem. And that's where it began. Right now our focus is the second... Uh, okay, I'm going to skip over that. Let's just go ahead. Um, <clears throat> For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, lying wonders, with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Now, I just explain here that I generally use, and, and you'll find the... Bible verses in this presentation are, are often the New King James. So if you're familiar with the Old King James, you might have picked up a little different wording there. Did, did, did something catch your, your ear just a, a tiny bit as I read right there? It shows up right there. What does the King James say? The regular authorized version 1611 King James, right? Do you remember what it says? A lie. Yeah, that they might believe a lie. Now, I'm not a Greek scholar. <clears throat> That's just something I've never done. Okay. But all my Greek scholar friends assure me that in the Greek, the preposition there is a definitive preposition. Okay. So maybe, and I used to teach English, so this is always fun. Do you remember the uh, the articles oh, that could be dangerous. Let's not do that. Uh, <laughs> okay. Do you remember your articles? What are the the articles? How many articles are there in English? Uh, not a, not a lot of enthusiasm for English here. Okay, I'll, I'll forgive you. That's fine. You, know, you can all speak it anyhow. I'm sure. A and and the. Those are the articles, right? A and an are what we call indefinite articles. And they're exactly the same word, except eh, whether the next word starts with a vowel, right? So I could say a dog, but it would be an apple, right? Same thing. The, or the, depending on how you want to pronounce that one, is the definite article. So now if I you know, peer out the back window there, and I said, Oh, there goes a car. Your response would likely be, yes, there's a road there. <laughs> Cars go past every so often, actually. You know, it's, it's not very specific. However, if I said, there goes the car, that would be a clue that somehow in the context of the conversation, you ought to know which car I'm talking about. You know, maybe it's the car that you were supposed to catch a ride with to go to town and you just missed your ride. Maybe that's the car we're talking about. Maybe it's the car that, uh, you know, hit the puppy dog down the street, you know, or something, you know, whatever. Or maybe it's the car that I was just telling you about that I saw as a getaway car from the bank robbery yesterday. So, but it's, it's an identifiable car. It's a specific car. That's the definite article. Everybody good on that? It's the lie. It's not just a lie. It's the lie. So what's the lie? And I'm going to say it's 
it's something, you know, it, there's, there's not a handy dandy, you know, next verse over definition for us in this case, okay? But what's the lie? And, and I'm going to propose that the lie is something very basic. It's more foundational to this whole experiment with sin than any specific thing, okay? Because it's a whole class of people. Those who, um, they do not receive the love of the truth, and so they're vulnerable to receiving the lie, okay? Okay, let's go on. Lucifer said, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. So Lucifer, and this is quoting from Isaiah, of course, and this is, this is, this is presented as, as what Lucifer said in the process of his rebellion, the intent of his rebellion. And, you know, we could look at this and say this is just groundless boasting, Lucifer saying, I'm going to be really important. And we could say, no, you know, Lucifer's not going to end up that way because uh, we know the end of the story and it's not going to work. Sorry. No points. Okay. I think there's a little twist to it, though. It's not just groundless boasting. It's an assertion about God as well. So he says, I will ascend. I will exalt. I will... Choose the most important place. And when I do, I will be like the Most High. Because that's what God did. He set up this whole universe so that he's at the top. God exalted himself. And that's all I want to do. I just want to be godlike. I want to exalt myself. And you know, playing literally here, playing devil's advocate for a moment, bear in mind that, number one, <clears throat> the angels had never experienced someone lying to them before. They were a little vulnerable in that regard. Uh, remember the Ellen White statement that they, they hardly even knew there was a law because everybody had just been keeping it. <laughs> you know? Everything was flowing nicely. They were hardly even aware there was a law. And when Lucifer comes along and starts throwing out suggestions or claims, you know, I, I'm not sure it would have been that easy to answer, even as an angel. So, like this, for instance. You may recall that one of Lucifer's other functions, aside from being the covering cherub, was the director of the heavenly choir, right? You know? So I'm imagining, this is all just my imagination, he's standing around talking to maybe some of the soloist angels or something. I don't know. And he says, you know, uh, a couple of days ago, you know, I was, I was thinking about something, you know, and, and I... I a funny thing occurred to me. Yeah, I never realized, really, I never really thought about it before, but you know how many songs we have in the hymnal? Yeah, yeah, 64,587,312. Yeah, yeah. Why are all of those songs about God? Every one of them. And when we all come to the city for worship, why do we always worship God? You ever wonder that? Why do we always worship Him? I mean, there's some other pretty cool folks around. And maybe a little later on in the process of things, when Lucifer was beginning to question whether God was in fact love or something other, how hard would it be to portray God as possibly maybe just maybe just being it wouldn't even want to use the word but maybe just kind of a little bit selfish after all he does own everything in the universe you know they didn't have answers 
And that's an important thing to realize, is the angels did not have answers to Lucifer's questions. Let's go on. So, I think what he's saying here is, when I exalt myself, I will be like the Most High. Because that's what God did. Satan boldly contended that in struggling to carry out his purposes and have his own way, he was only imitating the example of God. If God followed his own, fir own will perfectly and continually, why should not the first sons created in his image do so? God always does everything he wants. Why shouldn't I? Why shouldn't you really think about it? Why shouldn't you just do what you want? <laughs> You know, if, if you make the mistake of listening to advertising, <laughs> you know, get the credit you deserve. Oh, give me a break. <laughs> you know, um, advertising is all about it. All about it. Yeah, you know. Um, yeah, you're going to find that there are a lot of examples going on in our world today that are nothing more than repackaged versions of everything Lucifer said. Uh, most notably in advertising and, perish the thought, politics. <laughs> okay, let's go on. <clears throat> um, I want to make one point very, very clear. There never was... And there never will be a reason for sin. Okay? I just have to make that as a, as a complete categorical assertion. Notice the statement here. It is impossible to explain the origin of sin so as to give a reason for its existence. Sin is an intruder for whose presence no reason can be given. It is mysterious, unaccountable. To excuse it is to defend it. Could excuse for it be found or cause be shown for its existence, it would cease to be sin. I am not, in anything I say in the next about 10 slides or whatever it's going to be, I am not trying to give a reason for sin. I want to be as close as is proper to that, but I'm not doing that. Does that make sense? <laughs> what I'm going to do is I, I'm, I'm going to attempt to understand the, the rationale of Lucifer as to why sin developed the way it did, once it had been conceived. Does that make sense? Nothing I say is going to explain how sin originated. I hope to understand, and I hope to try and explain, how it developed once it was in existence. There's a key difference there. Okay. <clears throat> um, <laughs> Do we, do we really need to wade through this? You know, or is this one of those courses you can, you can graduate without having to take that course? You know? <laughs> is this an elective course? Can we just drop this? No, actually, we need to do this. Um, the evils which have existed in all ages will continue to exist till the close of probation. We need to understand the cause of these evils and the modes of Satan's attacks that we may be able to resist them. You know, Adam and Eve chose the knowledge of good and evil. They signed us up for the course. Um, we will, God's people will, before this thing is over, understand all there is to understand about evil. There is nothing we should dread so much as being ignorant of Satan's devices. Those who do not realize their danger because they do not watch will pay with the loss of their souls the penalty of their presumption and their willful ignorance of Satan's devices. There's, there's something to be said for understanding what your enemy is trying to do to you. Okay? And yet, <clears throat> we need not feel compelled to work out the solution of every problem that we cannot understand. The devil's going to bring stuff to us that I can't explain. I don't have to explain every stupid thing he comes up with, right? Nor am I to keep my mind reined up to thwart Satan's devices. Why? Because God is supreme. He is our stronghold in time of trouble and perplexity. If we put our entire trust in him, we shall find that he is an all-sufficient guide. 
I don't have to understand everything. I don't have to be able to explain everything. Because there's a really, really, really important thing that plays right there. It's called faith. Faith is what you resort to when you can't explain everything. And we will all have need of faith as this unfolds. Let's go on. <clears throat> Why would Lucifer hate us? Hmm. The greatest talents and the highest gifts that could be bestowed on a created being were given to Lucifer, the covering cherub. Before his fall, he was a glorious being occupying a position next to Christ. Okay. I want to notice a few details here. Lucifer, uh, let's see, i got to read the second verse here. Okay. Lucifer was a covering cherub distinguished by his excellence. God made him good and beautiful as near as possible like himself. So notice first a couple of things here. Lucifer was made good, right? He was created with the greatest talents and the highest gifts. All this was given to him, apparently from the moment he came into existence. That's not a bad way to start your life. <laughs> now, another little mind stretcher here, and my apologies to anyone who may, you know, I don't mean to step on toes necessarily, because we have all said commonly to our children, God can do anything. And there's a realm in which that's certainly true. But there are many things that God cannot do. Just look at that last statement there, the last sentence. God made Lucifer as near as possible like himself. So my question is, could God make someone who is more like himself than Lucifer? And the answer would be, no. <laughs> he can't do that, okay? That's just one of the things that God could not do, which underscores that Lucifer started off in a pretty good position. Okay, going on. <clears throat> so that's, that's Lucifer. The you know, famous military dictum is, know your enemy, right? So we're, we're kind of doing that here for a moment here. Lucifer chose to sin, and we will never know why he did that, because we can't explain that. What we do know is that that choice, that rebellion, happened a, shortly before, or about the time, God was getting ready to create earth. We know that. That's an interesting thing. When God said to his son, let us make man in our image, Satan was jealous of Jesus. He wished to be consulted concerning the formation of man. And because he was not, he was filled with envy, jealousy, and hatred. Interesting. Why would that be a big issue? Satan hates mankind because they are the workmanship of God. He opposed the creation of man. Okay, now, uh, how many things in the universe are not the workmanship of God? But there's something special going on here. He opposed the creation of man. Now, just normal English usage, that would be describing a, a, a circumstance before the creation. If it was after, we would normally say he objected to, or he criticized the creation of man, or something like that. But he opposed. You would normally, that, that's the kind of a comment you would make before the thing happened. So here's my question. Is, is it only coincidental, this, this chronological relationship between the rebellion of Lucifer and the creation of, of human beings? Is that only coincidental? No, okay, if it's, it's going to happen sometime, something, you know, something's going to happen the next day, so maybe it just, you know, it's coincidence. Or is there a cause and effect? I'm going to argue that I think two issues are very much connected. So consider these next statements here from Lucifer's position after he had secretly begun to cherish selfishness and pride. Okay? So this is after sin's already here, 
It's already in his heart. He's already feeling selfish. He's already, you know, getting a bit of a big head, so to speak. Next to the angelic beings, the human family, formed in the image of God, are the noblest of his created works. Okay? That, that makes human beings sound kind of special. Next to the angelic beings. So, which side of next to? <laughs> you know? Which, which side? Oh, angelic beings are here. Human beings are next to them somewhere. You know, you got 360 degrees. Where are they? Well, the earth was to be peopled with the beings only a little lower than the angels. Well, that's Psalm 8, right? Um, Hebrews 2, which quotes Psalm 8, same thing. Uh, man was created a little lower than the angels. Okay. Well, look at this. No other creature that God has made is capable of such improvement, such refinement, such nobility as man. Man cannot conceive what he may be and what he may become. Through the grace of Christ, he is capable of constant mental progress. Now, that statement makes human beings sound a little different than the way Lucifer was portrayed. Lucifer was made good, endowed with these gifts. Human beings sound more like they're kind of a work in progress. This is not a gift fully formed at creation. This is ongoing development. It was a wonderful thing for God to create man to make mind. God created man that every faculty might be the faculty of the divine mind. I can't explain that statement. I'm just, just tell you, I don't, <laughs> I don't really know what that's talking about. That's way above my pay grade. But there's something very special going on here to make mind. Are our minds different than angel minds? And, and remember, back here, last line, through the grace of Christ, human beings are capable of constant mental progress. It's kind of an issue of the mind. <clears throat> Man was the crowning act of the creation of God, made in the image of God and designed to be a counterpart of God. Man is very dear to God because he was formed in his own image. Wow, weren't the angels? Yeah. There's something special about man. Now that word counterpart is a fascinating word there. Um, you know, if, um, who should we pick on? Let's say, um, if uh, Joe Biden, President of the United States, were to have a, a special summit meeting with, okay, my ignorance is cropping up here. I was going to use Belgium. What does Belgium have? Does Belgium have a king or a president or a prime minister? Or what do they got over there? I don't, I don't have a clue what, what the political structure of Belgium is. But what is it? Think of prime minister. I'll go with prime minister. Okay. So if the president of the United States were to meet with the prime minister of Belgium, they would be counterparts they would not necessarily be equals. If I, you know, that's the only thing I can say about that, that statement. That's, that's, that's all I know. <laughs> I don't know what all the statement means, but I think that much is important to say that it doesn't necessarily mean equal. But it does make human beings sound pretty special. Consider this statement. God would place man upon probation to test his loyalty before he could be rendered eternally secure. If he endured the test wherewith God saw fit to prove him, he should eventually be equal with the angels. That's a new idea. Equal. Eventually equal. Again, we're talking of progress here. 
more statements. Let's try this one. Those who in the strength of Christ overcome the great enemy of God and man will occupy a position in the heavenly courts above angels who have never fallen. What happened to a little lower then? Why would Lucifer hate us? The work of redemption involved consequences of which it is difficult for man to have any conception. I feel like that. Yeah, <laughs> I'm lost half the time or more. There was to be imparted an excellency of power which would place him higher than the angels who had not fallen. <clears throat> Now, these last two statements that talk about higher, both of them are set in the context of after the great controversy. And so that raises some interesting questions. Number one, Lucifer wouldn't have known anything about what was going to happen after the great controversy. Number two, is there any chance that the whole experience of sin actually works out to man's benefit? Do we end up higher than the angels because of having gone through the great controversy? I'm going to argue with you. <laughs> I think there's, a, there's an element there. Where, yes, we certainly have a, a the experience. Yeah, but, but, and this is kind of important to me, Um, we'll, we'll, I, I got to tag in a couple more pieces of information about Lucifer, and then we'll answer that question. So hang on to that. <clears throat> okay. God was a light so effulgent. I love that word. It's a great word. That's a 25 cent word right there. <laughs> Not bad vocabulary for somebody who went through grade three. <laughs> Does anybody know what effulgent means? <laughs> It's actually a simple word. It's an old-fashioned word. It means really, really bright. <laughs> okay. God was a light so bright that Lucifer occupied the position of covering cherub so that the universe could at all times look upon his glory. But he had to cover it. He who was once the covering cherub whose work it was to hide from the heavenly intelligence is the glory of God, perverted his intellect and divorced himself from God. But that was his job, was to hide the glory of God. Okay? But notice this. Adam and Eve were granted communion with their maker with no obscuring veil between That was before sin, obviously. So now, if you have just a tad bit of selfishness and pride in your heart, and you hear the plans for these guys coming down the pike, you might just ask yourself, what's going to happen to your job if this idea catches on? <laughs> Who's going to need a covering cherub? when there's no obscuring veil needed. <clears throat> Through the imparted life of Christ, man has been given opportunity to win back again. Oh, this is answering my question. Sorry about that. But anyhow. To win back again the lost gift of life and to stand in his original position before God, a partaker of the divine nature. At the after 6,000, 7,000, whatever, you know, 7,000 counting the millennium, whatever you want to do with the chronology, doesn't matter to me at this point. After it's all said and done, through the imparted life of Christ, through salvation, we have the chance to stand where we were supposed to stand in the first place. The original position. Satan, in his efforts to deceive and tempt our race, had thought to frustrate the divine plan of man's creation. But Christ now asks that this plan be carried into effect as if man had never fallen. He asks for his people not only pardon and justification, full and complete, but a share in his glory and a seat upon his throne. Which tells me that the original plan was for man to have a share in God's glory and a seat upon his throne. 
I'm guessing Lucifer may not have been very keen on that idea. He should have. If it had not been that he had already incorporated some degree of selfishness and pride, when God explained this, it's, yeah, and then these guys are going to be elevated up to a position above you, Lucifer. Lucifer's response should have been, praise the Lord. That'll give me a chance to learn like a whole new thing. I've never been under any created being before. This will be, this will be interesting. <laughs> it would have been for Lucifer's good. I don't know how, but it would have been because everything God had ever done had been for Lucifer's good. But now Lucifer was doubting that. <clears throat> okay. Well, all of that maybe helps us understand this statement. The creation of our world was brought into the councils of heaven. There, the covering cherub prepared his request that he should be made prince to govern the world then in prospect. We would say probably in planning. It's kind of an old English thing. This was not accorded him. Jesus Christ was to rule the earthly kingdom under God. He, Jesus, engaged to take the world with all its probabilities. And I think that includes the probability of sin. The law of heaven should be the standard law for this new world, for human intelligences. Lucifer was jealous of Christ, and this jealousy worked into rebellion, and he carried with him a large number of the holy angels. Lucifer objected to the creation of man. But then apparently at some point he says, okay, well, it looks like I'm not going to be able to stop this thing, but at least put me in charge. And God said, no, no, that's, that's, that's not what we're going to do. And that didn't set well. So my point out of this is pretty simple. Lucifer hates you. Personally. You, as an individual. He hates you. This is a war. Don't expect your enemy to be playing patty cake. He hates you. Okay. Going on. The core of rebellion. <clears throat> At the core of Lucifer's rebellion, there is one very simple but immensely important issue. Notice how this developed. Once upon a time, God said, Lucifer, please do this. God had said that many times, I'm sure. Thousands? Millions of times? I don't really know what the time frame on this was. But God had asked Lucifer to do things before, and always Lucifer had done them. But there came a time when, for the very first time, Lucifer thought, no, that's better. God asked me to do this, but that's better. I have no idea what the issue was. Wouldn't it be ironic if whatever that, I mean, there had to be a first time, right? Am I logical in saying that? <laughs> I mean, you know, there had to be a first. Wouldn't it be ironic if the issue was something ridiculously small? Again, playing dumb imaginary games? What if the whole great controversy started because God said, Lucifer, let's use this for the opening hymn. And he said, but you know, I've worked hard with these guys for, with this other song. I want to do this one instead. <laughs> Could that have been the first time Lucifer thought, my idea is better than God's idea? I don't know. I have no idea. But you know what? Adam and Eve, I mean, hey, they messed up over an apple. <laughs> so, you know, it was a very simple test for them. In order to get to this point where God says, please do this, and Lucifer or I or anyone else thinks this is better, there are some things that had to happen. Had already happened. Either Lucifer believed God had made a mistake, so it could have gone like this. Lucifer, or God says, Lucifer, please do this. And Lucifer thinks, I don't believe it. It's like, 
Amazing. God has been like so smart, but he wants me to do that, and, and this is better. It's, it's like he goofed. Maybe that's how it was. There is another possibility. If he didn't think God had made a mistake, that means God knew what he was doing. And if God knew what he was doing, then Lucifer would have had to believe that God had deliberately commanded something that was not in his best interest. If he knows that that's better, but he's asking me to do that, how much does he love me? That's important. <clears throat> if, philosophically speaking, this is, this is philosophy from, well, I don't know, sometime in the last thousand years, I suppose, or maybe even before that. Anybody who believes in a supreme being, whether you call him God or... Who, who, are the, uh, who are the other options? I can't, Baal, okay, or, 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 or uh, Krishna, or whatever. If you believe that there's a, a, there's a supreme being at the top, you better hope that that being has three characteristics. He better be all wise, he better be all powerful, and he better be all loving. If you're lacking any one of those, you've got a real problem. If you've got a loving God who has all the power in the world but isn't that smart, things are going to go a little wonky. If you have a loving God who is smart as can be but doesn't have the power to make it actually happen, then that's the ultimate, hey, it's the thought that counts. And if you have a God who is all-powerful and all-wise and he doesn't like you, you're in a very, very bad position. Lucifer, right at the beginning, the moment he said, that's better than what God asked me to do, he either doubted God's love or his wisdom. It's fascinating that he never challenged God's power in the battle in heaven. That only came later and on a very specific issue. But he challenged God's love or his wisdom. <clears throat> in other words, Lucifer had lost faith in God. Even if God had just made a simple mistake, that was a serious concern. After all, God was in charge of running the universe. I mean, you know, you got a rounding error on your math and the sun just went supernova and a bunch of people got fried. You can't be making mistakes when you're running the universe. Who could trust his wisdom if it had been proven faulty? And if God hadn't made a mistake, then it meant that he was intentionally harming his subjects. Who could trust his love if it had been proven false? So Lucifer lost faith in God's wisdom and probably in God's love as well, and certainly in very short order in both. What we're talking about here is faith which you may recognize theologically as kind of a big thing through the rest of the Bible. There's a reason it's a big thing. It's because it's the, the foundational issue of the great controversy. Faith, I love this little quote, faith is a very simple matter. It is confidence in God. <laughs> That's all it is. It's a simple matter. It's confidence in God. And Lucifer lost it. And losing confidence in God is a big, big issue. What is it to be in an unsaved condition? Is it not to be living without that full confidence in God, which is born of love, which leads us to take him at his word? Righteousness is by faith. Justification is by faith. Salvation is by faith. An unsaved condition is when you lose that. It's a big deal. <clears throat> but that's not all. 
If Lucifer was smart enough to spot God's mistake, that meant Lucifer was smarter than God. Hey, yeah, I got it. He didn't. I got it. What's more, if God had tried to trick Lucifer into doing something that wasn't for his best good, then the mere fact that God had failed to fool him meant that Lucifer was smarter than God. Who's the smart boy on this block? Huh? Yeah. That's the stuff pride is made of. Now it would be easy for Lucifer to simply do what he was sure was the best thing. After all, he was the smartest kid on the block. And that's what we call disobedience. When you actually do the thing that God asked you, you know, other than God asked you, God says, please do this, and you do that instead. That's what we think of as disobedience. But it, it's based first on the loss of faith. Does that make sense? Tracking with me on this is huge, down the pike. So I'm just trying to you know, kind of sink this one in right now. <clears throat> but that's not all. Even if Lucifer never said a word about disobedience, his disobedience, the influence of his actions told all the other angels, you can't depend on God to take care of you. You need to take charge of your own life. You need to do what God does. You need to exalt yourself. This is the dawn of self-seeking, self Governance. <clears throat> that's a lie. You do not need to exalt yourself. But that's not all. Once Lucifer took the responsibility of caring for himself, it meant he had to do whatever it took to provide for himself. If necessary, that would mean stealing. If necessary, that would mean murder. There's only enough food for one of us, and nothing personal, but I have to take care of myself, so I will kill you if I have to. It's logical, you see. I think I just missed the comment there. Like Jesus said, Lucifer was a murderer from the beginning, the very inception of sin. <clears throat> Okay, our main goal in all this is to see how Lucifer went about spreading his apostasy. Well, okay, let's go on. So, <clears throat> quick review. If I don't believe God will take care of me, that's a loss of faith. If I think I can do a better job of taking care of myself than God can, that's pride and stupidity. If I try taking care of myself in some way other than what God asked me to, that's disobedience. If my influence convinces someone else that self-serving is better than service, that's lying. And if I put myself first instead of loving my neighbor as myself, that's stealing. And under enough pressure, it will become murder. It's a simple process, I think. It's not that complicated to, to see how it develops. <clears throat> okay. Well, we don't have time to cover all the statements in the Spirit of Prophecy to fill in this next set of details, so I want to list the specific tactics, the methods that Lucifer used to deceive the angels in heaven. That's important to us. Remember those statements about being ignorant of Satan's devices? Well, these were the original devices. This is how he deceived one-third of the angels. Um, there are good reasons to be, for us to be aware of these techniques, not because God wants us to use them. <laughs> no. Um, sadly, they are very common in the world. And if you have not yet been pressured by someone to use these techniques, it's nine-tenths of a miracle. And I don't think that would be the case in any of our lives. I think we've all seen pressure to adopt these things. Anyhow, our safety is in recognizing them enough to refuse them, right? So this is what Lucifer did, and this is how he went about it. <clears throat> he would exploit his position of trust as long as possible. He was the highest of the angels, right? He got away with figuratively speaking, murder. <laughs> he, he, he rode that one a long way down the road because they trusted him, and he abused their trust. He would hide his intentions from others. He would imply or insinuate without clearly, you know, making clear assertions. He, he wasn't really definite sometimes. We'll see some statements like that. He didn't 
he didn't lay things out clearly. He just kind of made it like, oh, yeah, well, you know, maybe this way, you know. He would distort others' perception, up to and including Ellen White speaks of hypnosis, which is a very formalized method of distorting someone else's perception. He would maintain plausible deniability. Does everybody recognize that phrase, plausible deniability? Some of you are maybe not into politics enough to know that. But let's just say that without naming any names and making any implication, let's just pretend that I was in charge of some level of government. Mayor of Vernon or Premier of BC or Prime Minister of Canada or any other location on Earth. And just suppose that for some reason there was something that I really, really, really wanted done, but it was illegal. It would be unseemly for me to be caught doing this illegal thing. And so what I would need to do is somehow discreetly pass down the line about three levels down the idea the boss would really like to see this happen. And somebody goes out and does it, an illegal thing. And if he gets away with it, then I'm just, you know, as, as being the chief culprit here, I'm, I'm just happy. It's all good. But if he gets caught, I have preserved plausible deniability. Well, that's a terrible thing he did. Who would have ever thought of that? I never heard anything about that. Well, the, we're going to, we will get to the bottom of this. We'll have an inquiry. <laughs> that's plausible deniability. It's so common, it's not plausible much anymore. But, you know, that's, that's what the word means. Okay, Lucifer did that. <clears throat> We'll see some examples of that. He would shift responsibility to others. Well, that was his idea. He would just plain lie if he needed to. He abandoned discredited positions without accepting responsibility for having advocated them. You know, he came up with some really stupid ideas along the way, and some of them ended up looking stupid. Well, if you're enough of a politician to understand the process, you drop it like a hot potato and you never mention it again. You don't say, oh, well, yeah, okay, so it looks like I goofed up that. No, you never say that. You just say, what? I don't remember that idea. Let's move on. People dwelling in the past. We need to get on with the, the work of the people. <laughs> I'm really not trying to incite rebellion or anything here. It's just, you know, don't, you know I'm, just, I'm talking about Lucifer, nobody else. He would cite supporters as evidence of his correctness. They all agree. And last but not least, why is God always picking on me? Yeah. They all just hate me. There's a vast conspiracy against me. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> a few quick statements along those lines. Satan began to stir up rebellion using underhand methods, winning a few at a time to his side. There followed that which had never before been seen in heaven. Satan began to place his thoughts in the minds of the angels. When he supposed that his suggestions and misrepresentations of God were entertained, he presented those whom he had deceived as originating these suggestions. It was Marvin's idea. He presented the suggestions as something that must be investigated. He easily gathered large numbers to listen to his specious devisings and thus, without compromising himself, succeeded in causing the minds of many to become disaffected. The unsuspecting were ensnared and taken. It's like, well, someone has accused, well, I don't know, accused is a kind of a strong, but somebody's raised a, a bit of a question about God's care. You know, as, 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 you know, one high in the government. I, I think that's important that we deal with that. I can hardly believe it, but, but Marvin raised this idea, so let's have an investigation. Let's talk about this. Is God really whatever? Yeah, 
Right. A lot of investigations are nonsense. Just, just my opinion. <clears throat> words have power to react on the character. Men are influenced by their own words. Often under a momentary impulse prompted by Satan, they give utterance to jealousy or evil surmising, expressing that which they do not really believe. But the expression reacts on their thoughts, on the thoughts. They are deceived by their words, their own words, and they come to believe that true which was spoken at Satan's instigation. It is dangerous to utter a word of doubt, dangerous to question and criticize divine light. We can deceive ourselves, and Satan is the one who originated that. <clears throat> Many of these angels who sympathized with Lucifer had occupied... Oh, okay, that's not... Well, well, this is good, but we'll come back to that other idea in a moment here. They had occupied high positions in the government of God. All were enriched with talent of intellect and were girded with strength and glory. This is kind of like, remember Korah, Dathan, and Abiram? Was it? 450 princes of Israel? If you're going to start a rebellion, you don't necessarily want to start with the rabble on the street. You, you, you want to get as much influence as possible. And Lucifer's no idiot. He knew that. So he went for, you know, the ones in high positions in the government of God. Lucifer was jealous of Christ, and this jealousy worked into rebellion. He carried with him a large number of the holy angels. We've seen that part already. Jesus, the Son of God, was not deceived by Lucifer's sophistry. He stood true to principle and resisted every line of reasoning of Lucifer and all the angels who had taken sides with him, thus evidencing, giving evidence, that as he stood, every angel might have stood. Boy, well, isn't that a fascinating statement? I'm going to tell you what I think, and I have not yet found an absolutely explicit. This is probably the strongest statement. There are others that hint the same direction. I'm, I'm inclined to believe that up until the time that God the Father had the big meeting and said, this is my son, he is equal to me, the angels didn't see him like that. I think he was manifesting himself as an angel much like he came to earth to manifest himself as a human being. Maybe that's just the role that Jesus always plays, is showing folks how to, how to fill their role in the symphony, or whatever it is. But that's really fascinating. Jesus resisted every line of reasoning from Lucifer. Huh. Okay, let's go on. <clears throat> the great creator assembled the heavenly host that he might in the presence of all the angels confer special honor upon his son. The son was seated on the throne with the father and the heavenly throng of holy angels was gathered around them. The father then made known that it was ordained by himself that Christ his son should be equal with himself so that wherever was the presence of his son, it was as his own presence. The word of the Son was to be obeyed as readily as the word of the Father. Especially was his Son to work in union with himself in the anticipated creation of the earth. I don't know. It's possible. I'm speculating, so don't take this as any level of gospel truth. But it almost seems like Lucifer might have regarded himself as basically equal with Christ. And it's like, somebody's going to get a promotion here, and it should have been me. <clears throat> well, yeah, I digress. <laughs> Christ is declared in the Scriptures to be the Son of God. From all eternity, he has sustained this relation to Jehovah. From all eternity. That's a long time. I, saw, I say, and have ever said that I will not engage in controversy with anyone in regard to the nature and personality of God. Let those who try to describe God know that on such a subject, silence is eloquence. Let the scriptures be read in simple faith and let each one form his conceptions of God from his inspired word. I would recommend that approach to all members of the Godhead. <laughs> 
I'm just not sure that any of us are bright enough to really nail things down and try to define with great precision some of the things that people like to discuss at times. I don't really care for those discussions. I would encourage you to avoid them. Going on. Satan exultingly pointed to his sympathizers, comprising nearly one half of all the angels, and exclaimed, These are with me. Will you expel these also and make such a void in heaven? And he probably thought the answer was going to be, oh, wow, that's a lot of angels. I guess, no, maybe we better rethink this. And maybe he was just flat, caught totally flat-footed when the answer was, yes, that's exactly what we're going to do. He probably did not know that he had gone too far at that point. When it was announced that with all his sympathizers he must be expelled from the abodes of bliss, Satan and his host threw the blame of their rebellion wholly upon Christ, declaring that if they had not been reproved, they would never have rebelled. I just have three more slides. <laughs> I knew she was going to have to take her little boys away, but... I'm almost done, so just, you might as well just hang on just a moment longer. Okay. They threw the rebellion, the, the, the blame wholly upon Christ, declaring that if they had not been reproved, they would never have rebelled. Don't play stupid word games with me. You were reproved because you rebelled. <laughs> Don't let people f flip things around on you. That's just insane. And most of society is flipped around on us today. It's insane. Lucifer cast the cause of his disaffection, his defection, upon Jesus Christ and upon God. If they had not so firmly resisted his plans, he said, he would not have gone on doing as he did. Well, that's stupid. <laughs> that's like, it's like, okay, hello, you know. What's, what's Newton's second law of motion? Something about an object in motion will continue with it until another force is exerted against it, right? You remember that? Ever take physics? Yeah, right. You would, you would have done something different if nobody had tried to stop you from doing what you were doing. I don't think so. It is impossible for man to measure the ingenuity shown by Satan in deceiving human minds. You know, I can laugh at what seems to be really stupid things that Lucifer said. I'll just be honest. I think God has presented them to us in a very dumbed down version so that we can make any sense out of it. You know, I mean, he was dealing with angels. Angels, I believe, you know, are on record as having pretty good IQs. Um, and he deceived them. So don't ever think that, you know, that any of us are smart enough to match wits with the devil. Okay. <clears throat> uh, give you an idea of how amazingly deceptive the devil can be. Lucifer's work of deception was done in so great secrecy that the angels in less exalted positions supposed that he was the ruler of heaven. Oh, what? <laughs> I, I, you know, this is one of those things I cannot fully explain. But I'm here to say that if he could pull that much of a trick over the angels, I'm not going to go up against him because I'm just like totally cooked already. While we are to become intelligent in regard to Satan's devices, we are never to assume that we are smart enough to fight him. Because the only fight that works is the fight of faith. Just remember that. The originator of sin worked with all his deceptive powers, and the Lord permitted this rebellion to develop before anything was done to save the angelic host from apostasy. Now, I will confess that the first time I read that, I was offended. It seemed so wrong. My little 
1960s baby boomer social justice sensibilities rose up in horror. <laughs> yeah. How could God not do something to save all those innocent angels? But it was right there in black and white. The Lord permitted this rebellion to develop before anything was done to save the angelic host from apostasy. Wow. I had, I had a problem with that. And we'll talk about my solution to that problem tomorrow. <laughs> so you'll just have to ride with that one for right now. <clears throat> okay, last slide. If you're going to have an argument, you have to have something to argue over. About 20-some years ago, I came up with a really, really simple idea. I said, what's the argument over? <laughs> what is the great controversy about? You know, if, if I say the car is blue, and you say the car is red, we could stand there all day and scream, each other, scream at each other and argue and smite each other about the head and neck and our frustrations. Or we could walk out to the garage and look at the car. <laughs> Why don't we walk out to the garage and look at the car? And so I said, what are we fighting over anyhow? And so what I did is I put together, uh, if you've worked with the Ellen White CD-ROM, or you can do the same thing on the app. You guys are probably all into apps and stuff, you know, but I still like my laptop. But you, can, but you can put together these really complicated Boolean logic searches. If any of you know what that means, you're good. If you don't know what that means, just trust me, it can get complicated. So I put together this monster big search that would catch any reference to Lucifer, Satan, covering cherub, arch apostate, great apostate, uh, you know, whatever else, the serpent, uh, anything that would you know, catch any reference to Satan, any reference to God or Christ or Godhead or divinity or heaven or anything like that, anything, I knew it had to do with the law of God, so I had a real good start there, anything to do with law or Decalogue or commandments or will of God or, or whatever else, you know, anything like that, and anything to do with argument, accusation, contention, complaint, whatever. And so my whole goal was, what are we fighting over? What, what, are, the, what are the complaints that Lucifer raised? Well, you know, it's fun to do searches like that, but it can be time-consuming. I came up with, I don't know, it's like 146,000 paragraphs. <laughs> and it took me a year to go through them all. I will confess, I skimmed some. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't read everyone, you know, make notes. No, no, it wasn't that kind of a study. But I was looking for the accusations. What, what are we arguing over? I would have thought that there would be dozens, but there aren't. They're worded differently, and so, you know, there's a certain amount of personal judgment involved in making them fit into categories, but I'm comfortable with just nine categories, nine accusations. This is what we're arguing over. And this is the order in which they came up in heaven. Angels are holy by nature and wise enough to govern themselves, so they don't need God's law. We got this, we're good, we're smart, we're holy, we're gonna have fun, don't need your help, thanks. <clears throat> that was the first one. What's interesting is that God immediately jumped on that. And it was between that first accusation and the second one that there was the big meeting. And God said, this is my son. Because the second accusation is God was unfair when he exalted Jesus above Lucifer. I should have got the job. I mean, it's like, you know, Jesus has some good points, I've got some good points, you know, yeah, but all in all, I, I think I would have been the better choice. I should have got the job. God said, no, no. I know what I'm doing. 
So Lucifer continued with complaints. God is selfish. He won't even listen to me. He's just being selfish now. God is unforgiving and revengeful. It's interesting the order. It's, it's, it's a really fascinating to watch the chronological order that these things developed. <clears throat> and I, I, I never had any idea of this until I went through that like a whole year of trying to ferret these details out. But he actually said God is unforgiving and revengeful before he said anything about the law. And, and so it's, it's kind of like, and he probably didn't say it point blank. God is unforgiving and revengeful. He probably didn't say that. He's laying out such a little hints. But I can almost hear an angel saying, well, I don't get it, Lucifer. How, how is that? How is that? So he said, well, he does it through his law. God's law is defective. It needs to be changed. Of course, God said, no, the law is perfect. And it cannot be changed. Really fascinating. God never says, I mean, in Ellen White's portrayal, she never has God say, I won't change it. It's always, it cannot be changed. Lucifer was probably in a problem there. The, the, God's law is defective. And again, I hear an angel saying, I am Lucifer. I don't, I don't get it. What are you talking? It's like, we've been keeping the law, you know, it's... it's it's been working. What's wrong with it? Well, nobody can obey it. Of course, he didn't talk about human beings originally in heaven. I added that in because that came in later, right? But he says, nobody can obey the law. And, and the angels are like, but Lucifer, we've been keeping the law for like forever? And I suppose, and this is a supposition on my part, I'm just warning you, you know, Lucifer said something like, you know, it's, it's, it's probably hard for you to understand, but if you had been where I have been, if you had been in the councils of God, if you had stood next to him as the covering chair, you would understand this. just a little bit different than you can grasp it right now. But trust me, you're never going to be able to keep that law perfectly. Number seven is the most important one in some ways. He says, God's law is arbitrary. See, because after five, God had said the law cannot be changed. And so Lucifer says, of course it can be changed. It's an arbitrary law. Arbitrary just simply means because someone said so. So I always like, the easiest example is Speed limits. Speed limit out here on the road, I don't know, 60K, maybe like that, something like that. Why is it 60K? Somebody said so. What if we make a pretty good argument that that's not the right number? Maybe there's a lot of kids that live along that road and 60 is too fast. Maybe there's thousands of people that need to get to work every day on that street and 60 is too slow. Could they change it? Of course they can change it. Just put up a new sign. Say something different. So Lucifer says, God, of course you can change it. Don't be stubborn. Don't be stupid. It's an arbitrary law. It is what it is because you said that's what it was. Just say something different. And God said, it's not arbitrary. It's perfect, and it can't be changed. And whether he thought this through in advance or whether he thought, wow, I've been you know, given a gift, I don't know. But the next argument is really fascinating. He said, God's law makes forgiveness impossible. You've read that, maybe? Seen that in the Spirit of Prophecy? You've seen that, that claim from Lucifer? You know, that, 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 that always struck me as the stupidest thing anybody could ever say. No. Yeah. Who am I to say that you can't forgive somebody you want to forgive? How in the world could you say, Lucifer, this is the stupidest thing in the world, to say that God's law makes forgiveness impossible? 
Of course he can forgive. It's just like, it's like, well, that was a terrible thing you did, but you know, uh, okay, I feel sorry for you, so I'll, I'll forgive you. It was only when I went to the work of reconstructing this line of reasoning, chronological order, I, I ding, the light bulb went on finally. Here's how it works. Lucifer says, the law needs to be changed. God says, it can't be changed. Lucifer says, God, of course it can be changed. It's arbitrary. You can change it anytime you want. God says, it's not arbitrary. I can't change it. It cannot be changed. And so Lucifer comes back with, oh, really? If, 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 if you're not even in charge of the law, you can't forgive anybody. If you can't change the law, you surely can't stop the penalty. And you say it's death. Lucifer thought he had God, you know, admit it. You can change it or admit you can't save anybody. And God said, Lucifer, the law is perfect. It cannot be changed. It is not arbitrary. And salvation is possible. And then Lucifer came back with the last argument, the obvious argument, the one he had to say, God's lying. <laughs> God's lying. You can't trust him. And that's where I want to leave you tonight. With this question. If you're God, and these accusations are thrown at you, what are you going to do? Okay, so now I got a little spider, somebody crawling on my head. <laughs> Don't really need him. What are you going to do? He's persistent, little guy. Something. Yeah, I'm hallucinating. That's possible too. Okay. <clears throat> what do you do? What do you do? What, what would God do? That's what we want to look at tomorrow morning. So we close with prayer? Let's bow our heads. Father, we are thankful that you have provided us an insight into the nature of the conflict that we were all born into. I pray you would help us to understand it, help us to recognize when we don't understand, and help us understand the value of faith in those cases. Lord, we just pray you'll go with us now, give us a good night's rest, and bring us back tomorrow, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.